Pamela, thank you very much for joining me. It is so great to be here. Yeah, I'm talking with Pamela Swim. She is the author of, of a few books, actually. Um, you know, the, the book that we're going to be talking about today, Pamela, it's your, your latest book uh, called The Widest Net. And we're going to be digging into all the concepts that are in that book. But first of all, Pamela, before we even jump into that, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're coming from, and um, how you got to the point of, of, of writing this great book. Absolutely. So I am a writer and a business coach and the co-founder with my husband, Daryl, of the Main Street Learning Lab, which is a learning lab right in the middle of Main Street, as the name says, in Mesa, Arizona. Um, I've been really working in the entrepreneur space for about the last 15 years. Prior to that, for 10 years, I was a management consultant in Silicon Valley, helping companies scale. And I found so many people who were interested in leaving. That led to my first book, Escape from Cubicle Nation, that I wrote in 2009. As I, as I began to work with people, realizing not everybody necessarily wanted to work for themselves. That was my second book, Body of Work, of kind of a new way we can think about what we're building. And the latest book I really consider to be the, you know, center of my heart and soul as a community builder, uh, the widest net is really how it is once we know that we have work that we're really passionate about, how do we build an audience for it? And more particularly, how do we see ourselves in the context of a bigger ecosystem that are helping our customers accomplish what they need to accomplish? That's great. And so, you, you know, you mentioned audience. So, you know, who, who do you, who is the audience for this book? The heart of the audience for this book are small business owners. And if we think about that, you know, as a primary audience, so that could be people, you know, the, the Small Business Administration's definition, up to 500 employees, up to $10 million. Um, but it also could be just for, you know, individual solopreneurs. That's really the heart of who it is that I wrote this book for. I also do a lot of work, and I think there's a specific application for software as a service companies that serve the small business market, because essentially all of their customers are um, small business owners, and the way in which they identify who could be good people to partner with and collaborate with, there's a lot of application for that market as well. Got it. You know, when I when I read the book, um, it to me it, it comes across as sort of a, like a marketing book, you know, mm -hmm. a, you know, like a branding and a marketing book. Is that, am I right in that? Or, or did you, do you intend it to also be something else? No, that's exactly what I intend it to be Good. because for this book, it, when the way that I think about work and the way that I think about marketing is when you are really deliberate, that you've created something that you feel really passionate is a good thing for the world. It's a product right. or a service that's going to make a big difference. Finding the audience for it is the number one thing that people that I work with want. I know it's the same thing for me. We, you know, if you, if you're, from just from a revenue perspective, of course, you need to have a flow of clients and that's something that most of my clients need, but also just from a big idea and like building things in the world that are going to make a positive difference, creating innovation, um, it, you, you need to find your audience and in particular to not just get onesie twosie people coming to your site, which can feel like you're building forever, but really sure. to have a more strategic way of reaching one to many. Yeah, that makes sense, Pamela. So, okay. So listen, there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of competition, a lot of people that are publishing books, you know, as you know. So why am I buying this book? This book to me is uh, different from a lot of the ways that we talk about marketing, because a lot of what I see, and part of the reason I wrote this book, is the metaphor we use often for building a business is building an empire. Right. And so a lot of things are about just positioning yourself as the sole expert. We literally say, you know, to build an empire. We, we look a lot at some of the growth hacking of people as really transactionals. It's a very transactional way to look at business. And hey, I get as excited by numbers and statistics and conversion rates as anybody else. It's part of the tools we can use to run a business. The part that I find really missing from the conversation 
is recognizing that for any great business, they really are in deeper collaboration with a lot of other ecosystem partners. And a lot of what I see, especially actually in the software as a service space, is they're recognizing that they need to be partnering with others in order to not have their ideal customers, um, you know, having to choose so many different options, for examples, right, of tools mm -hmm. they create. If you have a couple of companies, one that does accounting software and one that does marketing software, software and you know one that does lead generation it makes sense to do some collaboration that way so part of what i see is really needing to spread the truth that it's not an effective way to think about it where you're really the sole expert to solve your customer's problem mm -hmm. um, it ends up adding a lot of extra stress for people and i know i work with a lot of folks that by nature um, are more collaborative, sometimes by nature are not interested in necessarily creating a brand of personality where they're really that small business influencer. They want to have a solid business where they really are a solid partner and have some extremely established channels for marketing their business. So if I can, and by the way, we're going to start digging into some details in a minute, but I'm just, you know, it, it fascinates me the the whole concept that, you know, where the title of your book is The Widest Net. So mm -hmm. it, it, there, it, there's a big ecosystem of people that could be helping me. So Pamela, and by the way, Pamela, Pam, like what do you- Pam's mean? fine. Pam's yeah. good. Okay, so Pam, so I run a 10-person company outside of Philadelphia, okay? Um, we are, we, I've been doing it for like 25 years. We have about 600 clients that we serve. Uh, we sell CRM applications. So we do like Salesforce and Dynamics and Zoho and all that kind of stuff, right? Hmm. So- you know, I struggle with marketing. I struggle mm -hmm. with finding new business. Um, I struggle with retaining clients. I struggle with um, client, you know, customers that we, we, we sell something to, but how do we continue to evolve that mm -hmm. relationship to sell something more? So before we dig into the details, knowing what, what I've just told you about my mm -hmm. business, yeah. um, how do you think that your book would help a business like mine, if that makes sense. Yeah, to me, it really is walking through a process of really just stepping back for a minute. When you've been in business a long time, obviously, you're doing a lot of things right, right? You've grown a healthy business, you're serving customers. I mean, there's a lot of things you a have that are well established. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes that's true. But when you begin to kind of peel back and revisit and redefine certain core things. Like really, what is that ultimate mission that you're trying to accomplish? You know, what what really, especially in the light of the way that we've de deconstructed our entire economy and way that we're operating, right? Within the last couple of years, but really, what really is that mission that you're on? And then in particular to me, that the heart of establishing more of a strategic plan is in really spending some time in the definition in, in my chapter three, which is defining your audience very clearly mm. by problem, challenge, or aspiration, and looking specifically at who might be some either new audience segments that could be, you know, partner referral segments. There, I'm, I'm imagining that for what it is that you do, there's a lot of nice adjacencies of well, maybe there, Well, first of all, I mean, like the, the biggest source of our leads comes from partner referrals, yeah. like IT firms, things like that, right? That, that that's right, exactly. Right. So, so usually, you know, for some like more of an established business like yours, I think it can just be looking um, in a fresh way at really mm. understanding like what what is that shared mission that you might have with some of these partners sure. and doing deeper work in order to get more exposure, to build deeper relationships. Because sometimes there can be a lot of opportunity there. For other other times, there could be a new audience segment that, when you're looking at it a little bit differently, um, you might not even realize that you know was a potential. And in order to do it, you have to kind of step out for a moment of the way that you've done it. You know, mm -hmm. once you have more your plan, which to me is like the first third of the book, like mm -hmm. understanding that, looking at the ecosystem partners, then you just start to get into execution, which is maybe seeding new opportunities in a different way. And usually what happens with a lot of my clients is, is more focus, ironically, right? Sometimes people hear the widest net and they're like, what, I should just be marketing everywhere. It's really not that, it's about being strategic to look at the, totality of the space and then be very focused in the actual opportunities that you're going after. Great advice. That's great advice. So, okay. So you and your husband were looking for a space to open up your business, um, Main Street Learning Lab. So first of all, um, two questions on that. Um, number one is, 
Can you explain to me again what Main Street Learning Lab does? Like, what is your business? What is your mission of your business? Yeah. And also explain to uh, explain to me what what ke means. <laughs> Absolutely. Your husband's Native American, right? He is. He's yeah. Navajo. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. So. Um, by day, I always say, really, my core business is the business that I have as an author and a business coach and, you know, the programs that I run and books I write and things like that. Right. Um, my husband had a heavy equipment construction business for years, and, and he retired a couple of years ago and now does more traditional healing and wellness within okay. his community and here. So the Main Street Learning Lab for us. By the way, that sounds like such that sounds like such an Arizona thing, you know. (laughs) Isn't it? I know, right? It's actually really handy to have that, you know, collaboration together. It's just like you know, we live in Mesa, Arizona, and we do a lot of healing and wellness, and you know, right? Perfect, right? I know, and it's it's funny, you know, as we'll dig into a little bit more in the book. What's interesting is, you know, when you really start to get into making significant change, in particular here for our local region, there is like community building and healing and conversations and it's I you know always say we're kind of the perfect combination in many ways with with the way we complement each other but really the 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 focus of the learning lab it really is an experimental space where what we specifically do is provide space for especially BIPOC entrepreneurs in the community to be hosting events to be piloting new programs to be connecting with each other in the in the spirit of anybody who's familiar with innovation spaces where you really like we literally have a huge wall that's a big whiteboard wall it's the kind of space where you can really come in and just kind of share and explore different possibilities and within the context um, a lot of what's called an innovation district from the brookings institute if if you've ever read any of the work they're doing there really is a, a, a place within local communities and with local economic development to have a space that really is focused on experimentation, innovation, and community building. Mm. And so that really is our intention with the space um, is, is to have that, you know, kind of collision of different ideas. It has a very specific impact on my business because here I get to build relationships, hear what people are thinking about, and really have a more nuanced understanding and partners with people who are coming, especially from a lot of different backgrounds. So there's a very kind of correlated relationship, but we don't have a, the, the, the Main Street Learning Lab kind of innovation activities are not a monetized model. It really is something that feeds into the work that my husband and I are doing. Got it. So that in other words, do th- so you invite, you know, entrepreneurs, people that are, you know, starting businesses or maybe in their existing mm-hmm. businesses. Yeah. And it's a place to collaborate, to think, to innovate, right? Yes. Um, freestyle, the ability, there's a space to do that. And then, yes. you know, selfishly for you, I mean, you can identify people that you might be able to also help with some of your coaching or some of your consulting as well beyond that, I'm assuming, correct? I mean, sometimes that happens. It does kind of happen now naturally, but yeah. mostly um, it is about like making connections within the broader community because what yeah. kind of unanticipated um, opportunities that have come is we do have like Arizona State University um, move is building a brand new facility a couple uh, blocks down from where we are. And there's a lot of activity that's happening within our local area. So a lot of work has come from participating in that and doing connecting. But isn't um, that, doesn't that dovetail right into, you know, I mean, your book is called The Widest Net. Yeah. So here you are building a space that you, you're, you're offering this out to your community and connecting mm-hmm. with the community. And, you know, underlying all of that is expanding your network of people that know you and that you can hopefully help, right? It's exactly right. And, you know, the, a lot, the heart of the work I do, I often say I'm really an author practitioner. Uh, Sometimes I wish I could just make up a cool idea and, and, you know, sell a million copies of a book, but I really write about what I know. And in being an author practitioner, the more information and nuance that I have to literally have a learning lab where I'm watching every day, not just inside our space, but also talking to all these Main Street business owners, it gives me a really unique advantage in work that I might do with a lot of brands that are serving that small business customer. Because it's not hypothetical. It's not only just the people that I'm working with as a coach. It's trends and patterns and things that I'm seeing day by day. So it just really feeds my work as being a live innovation studio. The, you, you you asked about the name, what ke means. Yeah. And uh, yes. K-E, it's pronounced 
K E H, but it's spelled. I couldn't even understand the spelling. K in your apostrophe book. E with an accent. Yes, Navajo. <laughs> you know, as we know from the code talkers, right? Yeah. Is a is a right. uh, is a right. really beautiful deep language. Right. But the the concept of K, which was the the name my husband gave to our physical building, is within Navajo culture. There's a system of kinship, and so when two Navajos meet each other for the first time, they'll introduce mm. themselves by their two maternal and two paternal clans. And when they discover exactly how it is that they're connected by clan, the feeling that they have is ke. Huh. So it's like deeply rooted in understanding your place in the universe and historical connection, but it's also a deep place of belonging. And so a lot about what we do here as a community space is making people feel good, welcome, um, because that really is a prerequisite for creating safety so that people can imagine a new future and new products and new services and all the things that come out of the lab. That's why you're different than me. Usually when I meet people, it's more like, meh, you know, but for you. <laughs> right. Meh. That is the core of my personality. It's like, it's, it's my joy every day to be we, here. <laughs> we are just different people when it, when it comes to that. Pamela, who is Jeff Goins and why was he lost? Jeff is a good friend of mine who is a writer and for many years a writing teacher. Uh, he had a really vibrant online business, teaching people how to write and running a lot of group classes. Um, he and I knew each other for a really long time. And part of what motivated me to share his story is he was doing all of the things right that one says to a thought leader, you know, he's building online classes, he built his team, he, you know, was making a million dollars a year, just really tracking toward all of those things that one is supposed to do. Mm. The only problem was when he was actually inside his life and doing this, it just didn't really feel good. It mm. was doing all the right things, but the business model and the way he was doing it just didn't feel right. What was interesting too, is he shared more about the, the, dollars and cents is because he had such a big team that he was building to eventually scale in three, four or five years, he really wasn't making that much money personally. You know, I think he said around $80,000 a year or something, which one does. We've all, you know, seen what happens when you're Absolutely. scaling, you make the short-term sacrifice sometimes for the long-term uh, gain. But um, for him, I think it really, he sort of had a moment when he was actually making pancakes for his kids where he was like, uh, what am I really doing? The mission that I have, my joy and passion for writing, I'm not doing that. I'm doing all of these things because I think I should to impress my peers and mentors. Mm -hmm. And so he really just kind of deconstructed everything. He, um, you know, it was a hard transition. He had to let go of some really beloved team members, but he ended up scaling way back and um, refocusing, getting a much more profitable business for himself. And now actually, since, you know, that interview and, and since his business has progressed, he's moving into a really new, uh, new business model where he's actually excited to scale, but doing it on his terms. And because of that, you know, and because, you know, we're all searching to create, you know, the widest net as it is, hmm. that helped him to identify his values, which was one of the main steps that we all need to be taking, correct? That's right. That's that's the the pieces we were talking earlier of, you know, if you're wanting to revisit what's happening in your business and eventually get more customers, we tend yeah. to just start like out here of like what are how can I run a Facebook ad or, you know, what conference should I speak at? Right. When you really go back to understanding what is that connection that you have with your work and what do you want to do? To me, it always starts with a mission at the root and with your values. If that is not aligned, it is hard to have the required energy <laughs> and emotional fortitude that one needs to make it in business long term. It's funny. So, and just personally, you know, the CRM systems that we sell, I mean, I get wrapped up in selling licenses and having billable hours and making sure we're growing revenues. And in the end, um, I really should be thinking to myself, like Jeff, when he was making pancakes for his yeah. kids, like, what am I doing? Am I really, am I helping my clients grow their businesses? 
with these CRM yeah. systems because isn't that what it's all about? And sometimes we lose that focus because we just get wrapped up in our own shit. You know, what it I mean? is. It is so true. And it's easy to do, you know, and it just, I think there can be different seasons and different stages of business. Mm. Personally, you know, I, I don't know if you've seen this because you've been around the block for so long, like I have, but a lot of people can kind of poo poo the idea of, you know, having passion for business or being, yeah. you know, connected. It's like, it's just business, you know, don't worry about it. I just, as a 25 year coach, it is really significant when people do feel connection and meaning with the work that they're doing, when you know that by you going through the hard part of building your business, that you're actually making a difference for people you care about, yeah. it, it really does sustain you much more than you know transactions. See, you know, I see people in their, in their thirties and their forties. I mean, listen, I mean, there's a lot of stresses. There's a lot of pressure. You're trying to hmm. pay mortgage, you're raising kids, you're, you're dealing with, you know, your families and your business, whatever. So you just get kind of wrapped up in like, yeah, I just need this business because I need it as a livelihood, you know, yeah. so at some point in your life, I mean, you know, without getting into how old you and I both are, but you, you know, you, you hit a, per, a point in your life where you do start saying like, okay, I've, I've kind of hit those financial goals. And like, am I really doing something that, um, that I really enjoy and that I'm passionate about? Sometimes I bump into a younger person who has that passion you know, yeah. like, like, like doesn't give a shit about the money because they're like really into what they're doing. Yeah. And I'm so jealous of that person because, and they're, they're one and few and far between, you know? Well, and I'm 55. No, no shame in that. Like 56. I will own every single year. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm happy. It's just getting better every, every decade. Couldn't but, agree you know, anymore. Would rather you know, be 56 than 26. But anyway, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but you know, it's part of what we're seeing with the younger generations. A lot of them are not willing to tolerate the kinds of things that we did earlier in generations that right. looking for having meaning, having many more different phases of their careers, different iterations of business. I find that they can like grow and scale a business actually a lot faster given, you know, sometimes a, a connection with technology and tools and, and just good use of social media and community building um, that you know it is it is something that that they're more adept at but it really is a choice I, I wrote about in body of work my last book um, mm -hmm. growing up watching my dad who was a lifelong photographer one of the biggest gifts that he ever gave me was to the to the end uh, when you know he's about 83 when he had to stop taking pictures he died a couple of years ago but he had such great joy and connection with his work i yeah. never heard him like grumbling and he yeah. was just interested and curious and passionate i think we short sell ourselves and i think it's a bit of a cop out to just tell ourselves like well this is just what it is that you have to do even sometimes where you may make a choice, which can be a good one to take a well-paying job or have a certain kind of business to support your family and yourself, um, there still are ways that you can consciously connect to it and not just kind of trade off emotional well-being. So I just want to say it's, it is more of an approach that you have. It's, it really is not directly connected with age. It's more of a point of view that you have about your work and your life. Fair enough. It's fair enough. All right. So Pamela, you write about a woman named Susan Bear. And she has a, uh, what she calls an audience audit process. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, it helps her figure out what is step three in your book, which is describing the customer of her dreams. Can you, yeah. can you elaborate a little bit on what her process is? Yeah, Susan just totally changed my life and my whole approach to marketing and business. She's an audience segmentation researcher and specialist, and she mainly works with digital marketing agencies that are working with bigger brands. I imagine and meeting she, her at a cocktail party and having her give me that job title. Like I'm an audi I'm an audience segmentation and digital specialist, and just uh, being like. Yeah, what the hell does that mean? Yeah, I, I know. know. <laughs> I mean, it, it, but it, it is like, I have rarely met anybody who is so passionate about what she does. And she has a very clear point of view about her method, because so much of how it is that we're taught in marketing to think about our avatars, to think about our audience is really in demographics. You know, are you 55? Do you live in Arizona, New York? Do you work in the oil and gas industry? And that tells you nothing about how it is, you know, how your work really fits mm -hmm. into these bigger problems and challenges that your customers are trying to solve. Her method is at really the heart of getting very, very clear about really what your work is doing. What is your unique thought leadership? What is your, and, and I define thought leadership in the book 
as simply your unique approach to how it is that you solve the problems of your customers. But she has a rigorous process with her clients, with agencies. Um, she develops specific attitudinal you know, surveys where they get data back that helps them understand the different segments of why people will buy. And the, one of the examples I used in the book is Keep, that used to be known as Infusionsoft, yep. where they you know, have an audience similar to yours and mine, small business owners that are scaling their business and um, they used to just market you know maybe size of revenue or number of employees or something like that when really when Susan did an attitude at attitudinal segmentation survey they found that people's motivations for using the software was actually quite different some were these like passionate creators kind of like me who just love to create new stuff sure. and I just want to be in their work all the time building there were freedom seekers that were like Tim Ferriss wannabes they want to minimize the amount of work that they had there were legacy builders, people who are really building deeper infrastructure, often to pass their business on, you know, to a, um, to a, somebody in their family. And when you think about how different these attitudinal segments are, it makes a lot of sense when you think about marketing, 100%, right? hundred percent. You know, it's funny. It's, you know, given Susan's job as well. I mean, she, it sounds like she, it's a very data driven thing that she does. I mean, yes. she's doing customer segmentation, but the data only leads you so far. So, you know, in your example, if you're describing the customer of your dreams, for me to say like, yes, uh, we want to sell to all small businesses with less than 200 employees that, mm -hmm. you know, have a sales and marketing team. Well, that, you know, that's what the data says, but it kind of goes a little bit beyond that, doesn't it? It's like you just said, well, okay, well, what is their motivation? Why do people, why would they want this? Right. That's right. Because her research in particular is not demographics. It is attitudes. Okay. It's attitudinal segmentation. And you can see where it can fit sometimes, right? Yeah. When you might say, for freedom seekers, if, you know, your segment, because you're selling this software, right, similar types of software, you know, right. to, to the same kind of segment, right. that where you know that primary motivations for them are about just automating, getting out of their business, being really efficient, utilizing resources effectively, you can create such a good targeted plan within that segment when you see people who are in that area you might say wow i notice a whole bunch of folks are in the vertical of travel right. or you know a number of these people have apps and they're in tech so right. it's not that demographics don't matter you know or the, in order for somebody to have the resources to invest they need to have make this amount of revenue but the problem is normally is we start with the demographics and it just doesn't really tell you anything significant and it's in my limited. model yeah it doesn't link you to understanding other partners who are trying to solve the same problem yeah it's a really good point it's funny again you know we talk about our ages and the, the longer you live there the more you realize that people are complicated so yes. it's not just somebody that's under the age of 40 that you know, you know, as a sales team of six people, there, there's other things going on that drive their decision. And that's why it's important. You got to really describe that customer of your dreams. Um, Pamela, what is an offer or a product funnel? What do you mean by that? So I use a lot just well-known uh, structures from something like Ryan Dice's Digital Marketer for folks that have been around marketing for a long time. It's it's a way to understand in a in kind of a stepped way that generally when somebody goes from not knowing you at all to being interested in learning about you to maybe you know taking out their credit card and and paying a little bit for something you're offering and then eventually getting excited and maybe buying more from you right. that you need to be prepared in order to have things that are super relevant for them and that are designed in a way that they feel are perfectly designed for whatever their problem or challenge is. The right. offer design is one of the most like artistic, difficult, you know, parts I think of the process for any of us entrepreneurs, whether people are creating a product or a service, how can you just create something that people feel like, God, this is just exactly what it is that I need. And part of that to me in the method of creating an offer is um, so often I just find people who just get passionate about an idea, like I'm going to create an app mm -hmm. and they haven't first really understood what is, first of all, what is that core problem that their, their customer is trying to solve and what actually are the steps that they need to take in order to solve it, including things like developing positive habits and getting over mind trash and, you know, having obstacles for financing and all these other things. 
you have to really understand the overall trajectory of that transformation your customer is making from like having the problem to having it solved and then really design your offer to be addressing sometimes that entire journey, but more often maybe a specific part of that journey that you can do really well. And that to me is the difference that a lot of people don't take the time to do is they just get excited like, you know, hey, I want to write a book or I want to create an online class or I want to create an app. And I'm always, you know, the the 25 year instructional designer in me is always like, well, but what problem were we trying to solve? Like who said that that solution was actually what the person needed? You have to back up and understand the overall journey first. So how do funnels play into all of this? So funnels are simply once you figure that out and you figure out like what your specific offerings are, that goes back to that kind of stacked gradual opportunity where the first time somebody meets you, they may not be willing to invest $100,000, right, for right. working with you as a consultant, for example. Right. But they may be willing to do a two-hour specific paid webinar where you're sharing with them very specific tools that you know are solving a problem with them earlier on. Right. So it's just really a way to organize the different offerings that a customer has. And when you're doing it in particular, using digital marketing, you're, you're building bridges between those offerings. So for example, somebody reads a, you know, a blog post on your site, they might have a pop-up that has some kind of cool giveaway, you know, something that really is relevant to them that they can trade their email for. That email nurtures them maybe into this lower cost offering to get a taste of working with you. Once they do that, the email can nurture them into another. And that's the way often that you can just begin to, to really build this cohesion. It doesn't have to be email. This I know as a longtime consultant, mm -hmm. it really happens in conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody might do a class mm -hmm. with me or something. We have a conversation if they're interested in coaching. And I know that it is important first for them to build trust and make sure we're a good fit, that sometimes they have a, a little bit of a lighter experience before investing. Um, in the deeper programs. So, okay. So let's recap so far. You had mentioned at the beginning of our conversation that really, you know, like you, the third of your book is really where you're sort of like setting the stage and making the plans and doing mm -hmm. some thinking, you know? So, yeah. you know, you talked about your first step being finding, finding your mission and then identifying what your values are and then um, figuring out who the customer is of your dreams. And then what's your offer going mm -hmm. to be, you know, mm -hmm. um, that will bring them in. Now, you know, what's next, I think, is starting to, to go out there and, yeah. and, and actually start, I don't know if solicit business is the right word, but start to actually do business with people. So you talk about watering holes, you know, mm -hmm. where, where people gather. Um, you, you picked on me as a CPA because you talked about the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. And yes. You said, like, uh, in case you haven't figured out, I am a CPA. There's the lack of hair <laughs> on the glasses should have tipped you off at the beginning of this conversation. Um, so where do we gather? Where do accountants mm. gather, Pamela? And you're using us as an example. Why is it important to find those, those watering holes, as you mentioned? Totally. Well, of course, I'm going to flip it and ask you in a minute, because that's one of the best ways you can find out is by asking somebody who has that profession. Yes. But the, the concept of watering holes, this is really what introduces us to the core heart of the widest net method, which is right. saying, if I, as a business coach, for example, am interested in um, connecting with CPAs because, right, I want to help you grow your firm. You would be in the center of an ecosystem. And that ecosystem are basically places where you are looking for information, resources, support, technology in order to grow your business. Right. There are so 10. In other words, if I, can, if I can, you literally have to put your head, your head into the head of that CPA, for example, like where are they going? Correct. That's right. Okay. And, and really, you know, to center it again, this is just a kind of a direct juxtaposition with the way that we often talk about businesses. We're like, we are the center and we're attracting everybody to us. Like if I just show people how smart I am as a business coach, they're going to come to me. I argue, put your ideal customer in the center of the ecosystem, right? So you would be smack dab in the middle of looking for software to help grow your business, thought leaders, you might watch TED Talks, you might go to events, you might, do you belong to any associations of CPAs? The American Institute of CPAs. Okay, as well as the right, Pennsylvania right? Institute yeah. of CPAs, right? 
Right, so in Pennsylvania, so here's a, just a beautiful example. Associations are some of the best watering holes. And what that mm -hmm. means is simply a place in person or online where great amounts of your ideal customers gather together. So yeah. if I am interested in, in working with CPAs as my ideal audience segment, I, here's one example. I could go to your chapter in Philadelphia, right? And right. I would walk in the room and I would have a room filled with CPAs, which is exactly my target audience. It's an awful now, I imagine, thought, but okay. Right? Yes. <laughs> you know, and then, and then I could go to Pittsburgh and then I could, you know, go to the association in New York and, or I could speak at the annual conference of maybe the national convention. Right. And, and, you and then you would see... need to go to a spa in Arizona for like weeks of therapy and relaxation. <laughs> I love CPAs personally, I have, just because I work with you all so much. But, you know, really, it, it kind of is a perfect example of imagining where, you know, when you can have that feeling where yeah. you're like, ah, oh, where can I reach my ideal folks? When you've taken the time to understand that maybe, you know, it's a CPA interested in growing their business, but in a particular way, right? Somebody who wants to do it ethically, you know, somebody who's not, who hates social media and, you know, is really more interested in building a referral network, right? So there can be some nuances to how you sure. choose it, sure. but just by having that definition and then finding some of these watering holes yes. for many of my clients like all they would need to do is basically work the circuit right of meeting a whole bunch of folks that are going to be in those association meetings and of the folks in that group not every single person might be interested but sure. it's a much more targeted way of working with them so that this concept of watering holes is so critical for the strategic design of how you spend your marketing energy your marketing money and your marketing activities because where you where you would ask you know your ideal client and people you work with like who is your you know what is the favorite podcast that you listen to about growing a business what's yours i'm curious oh i have a, a number of different podcasts that, that i listen to i mean i do listen to ted talks um and i also listen to um um, Malcolm Gladwell's revisionist history is really good as well. Yeah. Um, but really when it comes to growing my business, um, the planet money is really excellent. And the indicator on NPR, um, to me, um, everything is financial. So I like to follow what's going on in the economy. So it helps me make those decisions, you know? Yeah. I love Plus, that. Conan O'Brien and, you know, all sorts of other ones that make me laugh. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. So there, there can be, you know, for us generally as consumers, there can be all kinds of things we listen to yep. when you're doing the ecosystem analysis for your marketing. It generally are, you're looking for the segment of media or, yep. you know, associations and so forth that are related to solving the problem that you solve. But I do, you know, I do want to also say like, you mentioned about associations. I just have to also jump in there because they seem so underused. If my, if my clients, if they're going to leave their office, they're going to go <laughs> somewhere and get on a plane somewhere, it's either going to be on vacation with their families, or it's <laughs> going to be to their, their annual conference with their association. And it could be the, you know, tube distributors association, the corrugated container association, the plastics and resins manufacturers association, all sorts of boring, boring associations, but that's where they go, you know, to, you know, and that is like the perfect, that's the perfect watering hole. Yeah. Pamela, you know, I just want to make sure, cause I want to cover all of your concepts. You talk about the easy breezy zone mm -hmm. and then you go on to talk about in your next step, you talk about brick and mortar beacons. Yeah. Let's first of all, let, let me ask you, what, what do you mean by an easy breezy zone? This is under your step six, which is the seeds you plant. What, yeah. what, what do you mean by that? So we've kind of built this foundation. You understand what you're doing, who your customer is and where the watering holes in, in which they gather. Sure. I think often people get freaked out about marketing or they stop doing it or they do it poorly mm. because they they move too quickly into like asking people for something. If you've yeah. ever been accosted on LinkedIn where you linked, link with somebody and instantly, and I don't mean something thoughtful like, oh, I love your show. I've been listening to you for five years. I mean, that can be really wonderful when there's a heartfelt connection. But generally, if, if the first time you meet somebody at a conference or, you know, on LinkedIn or anywhere, they're immediately trying to sell you something. It feels so awkward. Agreed. And what I really want to bring back and what I do always as a community builder is to recognize there is this time where you're really just listening and getting to know somebody. You can just kind of relax if you're going for the first time into that association meeting where you've never been before. You don't have to be working the room and trying to close business. You can use it 
more as a chance to listen to, like, how are people talking about their business problems? What's important to them? Who are the other speakers? And then when you do have a conversation, just to take some time, right, to just get to know the person, not coming on so strong. Yeah. And it's not, it's not a manipulative tactic where, like, you do that just to catch them in your web, and then all of a sudden you're going to pounce on them. It, you to have the right kind of partners and customers. And in my experience now in 25 years, I have a lot of folks I am still connected with and I end up still doing business after all these years. Thank You're you. looking for fun, interesting, creative people to work with. Like they mm-hmm. want to work with somebody they really enjoy that can help them. And you really want to work with somebody who you believe in, who is interesting to work with. And so that just takes a little bit of time to relax, get to know people. And that's a, a part of the seeding process that could include research, but also just chilling out a little bit before it's you're basically me just bouncing. being easy and breezy, right? Yes. Like, like you just said, just chilling out and you're not, because I do, um, that happens to be on LinkedIn all the time. Sometimes I get just aggressive pitches from people that I don't even know from Adam. Uh, and you're right. I mean, the, the world is based on relationships and you have to let them evolve a little bit. Like just stop with pulling a gun out and trying to shoot somebody to make a sale, you know, just Relax That's right. And let, it, and let it go. Yeah, because usually at that point is where you have, you're kind of at a desperate point, right? Because you haven't done that earlier stage planning. And we've all been there. Like, I do not judge. I just want to be really clear that mm. I know what it feels like sometimes <laughs> to need to pay your mortgage or, you know, like you need to make things happen. It's okay, but it's a symptom that you really haven't taken your time to really put in like natural ways in which you're connecting with people. Um, so that's kind of for seeding and there's very specific ways of doing it. It doesn't necessarily have to take forever when you're doing seeding, but there's a lot of specific ideas within that chapter. For the, for the beacon, this idea of beacon, because a lot of what I talk about earlier in the book is listening, you know, getting to know the community, figuring out, paying attention. So you're really using language and creating offerings that are helpful, that are, you know, aligned with where people are, you know, what what they're thinking about as your ideal customer. A beacon is really that place where what I define as a beacon is a is a specific communication vehicle that you use to share your thought leadership. So I would imagine for you, it's a podcast. I know you're a writer too. Is that fair? There's there's different ways um, to do that. I mean, you know, it's it's a really, it's a really interesting point. I mean, there's been such God, for years, Pamela, like we've been hearing like email is dead, email is dying, it's your whatever. Meanwhile, email newsletters have been growing in popularity. And now all of a sudden I find myself subscribing, subscribing, like, and sometimes paying money to receive newsletters from certain people that I really want to hear their thoughts every week, you know? Yes. And I guess that's their beacon that you're talking about. That's their beacon because it's well curated. It's well designed. It specifically addresses the problem or challenge they have. I use, you know, a bunch of examples. Morning Brew is one. I love Morning Brew. I love Morning Brew. It's so great. And here they're spinning off into getting tons of different, you know, marketing. You know, another really good one is um, the 1440 Digest. I don't know if you ever get that one. Oh like, no! I'll check it Google out. It, it's the fourteen forty. What's really good about it is similar. It's similar to Morning Brew, but it hmm. is very. Um, it is nonpartisan, so it yeah. is, it, it's a news summary with some fun links, you know, yeah. included. Um, but it just presents the news without any kind of a slant, which in this day and age, you know, I think a lot of us would appreciate. Do you know what I mean? It's super so, helpful for sure. So that's yeah. their beacon, their, you know, their, their daily morning newsletter. That's and I guess right. beacons can be like you mentioned podcasts. If that's like, for example, you know, if, if you're running a business and you want, um, you know, you're, you're going to say like, you know, damn it, I'm going to focus on this podcast. That's going to be mm. my beacon. That's yeah. how I'm going to be getting information out. And that is yeah. my main thing. Right. And that's I guess right. the biggest, um, if I can ask you the, the, the biggest you know, risk that you have there is spreading yourself too thin. I mean, I see too many, too many people trying to do too many things or use too many people. Yeah. I think that's it. And so that's why to me, it is important strategically to choose a primary beacon. I use, you know, Brene Brown as an example of she really has zeroed in on podcasting, you know, doing a partnership with Spotify. We know she has a huge audience. I used her as an example of somebody who crosses so many different audience segments, right? With the clients that follow her work from the military, CIA, Disney, you know, social workers, like she has this really interesting audience, but you need to strategically decide where you're going to really put your effort. A beacon has to be a place where your ideal clients 
go where they listen for information because even if you love to do it and none of your clients listen to podcasts that's not a good beacon you have to meet in the middle but there are satellites right social media satellites you can have an episode you can parse it out share it on linkedin you know and i I recommend maybe two or three kind of social media satellites that you choose deliberately but a lot of people get overwhelmed of just doing a bunch of things in a kind of a half-assed way and it doesn't work it just you're frustrated and there's no one place if if you're to to tell somebody you know if you really want to get to know my point of view this is what you should do for me it's been my newsletter i've had my newsletter since 2004 and it just it's a place I love it I love to write it I've had people who have been subscribed for a long time yep. and it's helpful for me to know that that's my primary beacon so you you cover 10 steps in the book um you know the final step is is about your ecosystem and protecting mm-hmm. your ecosystem and yeah um you talk about creating an ecosystem map can you can you expand on that So really when a a lot of the the strategic work that you're doing for, you know, understanding your audiences in a different way, being deliberate about choice for your marketing beacons and vehicles, you know, beginning to do seeding, what I call tiny marketing actions, you know, like operationalizing, taking consistent small actions over time with a lot of hearkening to James Clear's methodology within Atomic Habits. Um, Of course, there's a point where you want to be operationalizing and systematizing um, the way that you do your marketing. And so there's really a lot of when you have this ecosystem map, if you're always going to be aware, first of all, of your choice of core audience segments within the the ecosystem wheel, right? You might say, I'm really in 2022, I'm going to really narrow down and make sure I'm doing very deliberate connection with this market because it is deep and I am not reaching who I know all the people I can reach in that segment. Or you might say there's a new audience segment that I'm really going to put some deliberate energy into to begin to seed and build relationships. You want to have a way that you can easily capture information and, you know, and store it. So some of that is just very pragmatic of the tools that you use, whether it's something like Pocket, you know, where you're like, oh, wow, here's this super interesting conference that probably is just teeming with people who are my ideal audience. Mm -hmm. How can I quickly take it? categorize it in which ecosystem segment they're in, link it to maybe content that I'd create or a reminder in order to do something about it. Because when you're looking more strategically at the wider net, it is easy for for people to get overwhelmed, right, with so much to track. So that's part of how you make sure that your systems, many of which you sell, (laughs) are really set up so that it's easy for you to process information that comes out and begin to create more of a rich repository. It also makes it easier for other people on your team where you have a marketing agency or a marketing manager to take that thinking and begin to really implement it. Because that ultimately, I think, is the area that will keep you fresh. And I don't know what you find. I find that people, I always say, (laughs) one of the reasons why we file our taxes all the time and we track our finances is because we will get in big legal trouble if we don't. And we have, it'll affect our credit score, like very concrete things that keep us from doing what we want. Nothing bad happens. Like, besides not having enough clients, right? If we're not doing our marketing activities, it's the kind of thing we're like, ah, you know, I, I'm really busy right now. I'll get to it later. Of course, that's a fatal error. You have to be doing marketing consistently. So that's part of my argument is if you don't make it, if you don't operationalize those activities, if you're not really organized in how you're doing it, um, you're just going to like do a big burst of activity and then it will drop off until you know, the entire economy shuts down and all of a sudden you're panicked realizing you haven't taken the time to build some new market opportunities. The book is called The Widest Nets. And I've been talking to Pamela Slim. Pamela, before I let you go, uh, say somebody runs up to you in an airport and says, I've just finished The Widest Net and I mm-hmm. loved it. What would you What would you like to hear that person take away from this book? Uh, first, I'd love them to hear like, oh my gosh, there are more opportunities than I than I thought of. Like, yeah. you know, I was sort of worried that maybe nobody would, you know, be interested in buying my thing. And all of a sudden, I see all this potential of, you know, what did I can what I can do. Sure. The second thing that I hope they take away is I don't have to be one of these wheeling, dealing, transactional business owners that I can actually love and care about, you know, my my clients, my community, and I can build partnerships that will be supportive so Mm. that I don't have to do it all myself. 
Mm. I feel like that's the greatest gift I have every day is I have so many fantastic partners, peers, collaborators that no matter what's happening, I always have, and, and no, no pun intended, this wide net around mm. me that like will not let me fail, will help me think creatively. And that kind of support is really what I wish for every person and every community to have this sense of cohesion where no matter what's happening, you know, during the, the, um, uh, everything with COVID, when our main street shut down, we didn't lose any businesses. And a lot of that is because of the kind of connections that we have and the way that people specifically work together. The widest net by Pamela and Slim. Pamela, thank you so much for joining me. There's a great conversation. I learned a hell of a lot. So, uh, you know, just, it, it's a great book. I really enjoyed reading it. So um, thank you. And I wish you the best of success. Thanks for having me. Sure thing. Everybody, you've been watching BizBooks. My name is Gene Marks. Thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll see you next time. Take care.